This is chapter 4 of the book Paddington at Large, written by Michael Bond. Paddington hits the jackpot. Lucky for some, exclaimed Mr. Brown. Don't tell me we've got to sit and watch that awful thing. Isn't there anything better on the other channel? The rest of the family exchanged uneasy glances. Paddington did ask if we could have it on, said Mrs. Brown. It's his favorite program and he seemed particularly anxious we shouldn't miss it tonight. In that case, said Mr. Brown, why isn't he here? I expect he's popped out somewhere, said Mrs. Brown soothingly. He'll probably be back in a minute. Mr. Brown sank back into his seat with a grunt and stared distastefully at the television screen as a fanfare of trumpets heralded the start of Lucky for Some and the master of ceremonies, Ronnie Playfair, came bounding onto the stage, rubbing his hands with glee. I wouldn't mind, said Mr. Brown, if he asked sensible questions. But to give all that money away for the sort of things he asks is ridiculous. The dining room curtains were drawn and the Brown family, with the exception of Paddington, who had been unaccountably missing since shortly after tea, were settled in a small half circle facing the television set in preparation for their evening's viewing. Over the past few weeks, a change had come over the routine at number 32 Windsor Gardens. Normally, the Browns were the sort of family who entertained themselves quite happily. But since the arrival of the television set, practically every evening had been spent in semi-darkness as they sat with their eyes glued to the screen. All the same, although Mr. Brown was the first to admit it out loud, the nine days' wonder of having pictures in their own home was beginning to wear thin, and there were several signs of restlessness as yet another fanfare of trumpets burst from the loudspeaker. I do hope nothing's happened to Paddington, whispered Mrs. Brown. It's not like him to miss any of the programs, especially a quiz. He's very keen on them. That bear's been acting strangely all the week said Mrs. Bird, ever since he got that letter. I have a nasty feeling it may have something to do with it. <laughs> well, it can't be anything bad, said Mrs. Brown. He seems to have spent all his time with his whiskers buried in those encyclopedias of Mrs. Mr. Gruber's. He even missed his second helping at lunch today. That's just it, said Mrs. B Mrs. Bird ominously. It's much too good to be true. While Ronnie Playfair's face grew larger and larger on the screen as he explained the program to the studio audience and the viewers at home, the Browns began to discuss Paddington's strange behavior over the past week. As Mrs. Bird said, it had all begun when he'd received an important looking letter by the first post one morning. At the time, no one had paid it a great deal of attention, for he often sent away for catalogues or any free samples which he saw being advertised in the newspapers. But a little later, that same morning, he had arrived home pushing Mr. Gruber's encyclopedias in his basket on wheels, and the next day, after borrowing Mr. Brown's library tickets, Another pile of books had added themselves to the already large one at his bedside. He's been asking the oddest questions too, said Mr. Mrs. Brown. I don't know where he gets them from. Well, wherever it is, said Mr. Brown, as he looked up from his evening paper, I hope he gets back soon. Mr. Brown liked plays, and he had just discovered that there was a particularly good one about to start on the other channel. Crikey! exclaimed Jonathan suddenly, as he jumped up from his seat and pointed at the television screen. No wonder he isn't here. Look! Gracious me! exclaimed Mrs. Bird as she followed his gaze. It can't be! Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses. 
It jolly well is, he said. It's Paddington and Mr. Gruber. While the Browns had been talking, Ronnie Playfair had finished describing the workings of the program. Waving his hand cheerily to the studio audience, he stepped down off the stage in the beam of a large spotlight and announced that the first contestant of the evening was a Mr. Brown of London. I just needed my shawl. Mr. Brown. Um, uh, Mr. Brown of London. As he made his way up the aisle, the camera followed him and eventually came to rest on two familiar faces at the end of one of the rows of seats. Mr. Gruber's look of embarrassment was tinged with a faint air of guilt as he caught sight of his own face on a nearby screen. <laughs> Although Paddington had assured him that the Browns liked surprises, he wasn't at all sure they would be keen on this particular one. But Mr. Gruber was soon lost from view as a small brown figure Sitting next to him, raised a battered head to the camera and hurried up the, the aisle after the master of ceremonies. If the Browns were overcome at the sight of Paddington climbing onto the stage, Ronnie Playfair was equally at a loss for words, which was most unusual. Are you sure you're the right Mr. Brown? he asked nervously, as Paddington dumped his suitcase on the stage and raised his head to the audience. Yes, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington, waving a piece of paper importantly in the air. I've got your letter asking me to come. I, uh, I didn't know there were any bears in Notting Hill Gate, said Ronnie Playfair. I come from Peru, said Paddington, but I live in Windsor Gardens. Oh, well, said Ronnie Playfair, recovering himself slightly. We won't ask you to prove that. But I suppose we must expect the bare facts tonight. <laughs> Prove that, he repeated, laughing at his own joke in a rather high voice. Bare facts. His voice died away as he caught Paddington's eye. <laughs> Paddington <laughs> didn't think much of Ronnie Playfair's jokes, and he was <laughs> giving him a particularly hard stare. I can do that too. Uh, perhaps you'd like to step forward and send a message home, said the Master of Ceremonies hurriedly. We always ask our contestants to send a message home. It makes them feel at ease. Paddington bent down and took a piece of paper out of his suitcase. Thank you very much, Mr. Playfair, he exclaimed, as he began advancing on the camera. <coughs> <clears throat> the Browns watched in dumb fascination as Paddington loomed larger on their screen. Hello, all at number 32, said a familiar voice. I hope I shan't be late, Mrs. Bird. Mr. Gruber promised to bring me straight home and... Whatever else Paddington had been about to say was lost as there came a loud crash and the picture disappeared from the screen. Oh no, cried Judy. Don't say it's broken down, not tonight of all nights. It's all right, said Jonathan. Look, they've got another camera on. <laughs> As he spoke, another picture flashed onto the screen. It wasn't quite such a nice one as the close-up of Paddington had been, until just before the end, when it had suddenly gone soft and muzzy, that one, that one had shown almost every whisker whereas the new picture was looking towards the audience and there appeared to be some confusion. One of the cameramen was sitting on the floor surrounded by wires and cables rubbing his head and Ronnie Playfair seemed to be having some kind of argument with a man wearing headphones. He wasn't on his marks, cried the cameraman. He kept following me. You can't take proper close-ups if people don't stay on their marks. Paddington peered at the floor. My marks, he repeated hotly, but I had a bath before I came out. He doesn't mean dirt marks, said Ronnie Playfair, pointing to a yellow chalk line. He means that sort. You're supposed to stay where I put you, otherwise the cameras can't get your sh their shots. 
You did ask me to step forward, said Paddington, looking most upset. I said, step forward, said Ronnie Playfair crossly, not go for a walk. Ronnie Playfair had been master of ceremonies on Lucky for some for several years with never a word out of place, let alone an upset like the one that had just occurred, and there was a strained look on his face as he picked his way back across the cables, closely followed by Paddington, who was peering anxiously at the floor in case he lost sight of his chalk mark again. Now, he said, as they reached the centre of the stage and stood facing the other cameras, what would you like to be questioned on? He waved his hand in the direction of four barrels which stood in a row on a nearby table. You can have history, geography, mathematics or general knowledge. Paddington thought for a while. I think I'd like to try my paw at mathematics, please. He announced amid applause from the audience. Crikey, exclaimed Jonathan, fancy choosing math. Knowing the way Paddington does the shopping, said Mrs. Bird, I think it's a very wise choice. <laughs> Paddington had a reputation among the street traders in the, <clears throat> in the Portobello market for striking a hard bargain, and it was generally acknowledged that you had to get up very early in the morning indeed in order to get the better of him. I must say he always keeps his accounts very neatly, said Mrs. Brown. I'm sure it's the right choice. Mathematics, repeated Ronnie Playfair. Well, we'd better look for the first question. He put his hand into one of the barrels <coughs> and withdrew a piece of paper. A nice easy one to start with, he announced approvingly. And a very good question for a bear. If you get it right, there's a prize of five pounds. After a short roll of drums, Ronnie Playfair raised his hand for silence. For a prize of five pounds, he announced, how many buns make five? I must warn you, he added, winking at the audience, think carefully. It may be a trick question. Paddington thought for a moment. Two and a half, he replied. Ronnie Playfair's jaw dropped slightly. Two and a half, he repeated. Are you sure you won't change your mind? Two and a half, said Paddington firmly. Poor old Paddington, said Jonathan. Fancy getting the first one wrong. I am surprised, said Mrs. Bird. It's not like him at all, and as he's got something up his paw. Oh dear, said the master of ceremonies as he picked up a hammer and struck a large gong by his side. I'm afraid you're out of the contest. The answer is five. I don't think it is, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington. <laughs> it's two and a half. I always share my buns with Mr. Gruber when we have our elevenses, and I break them in half. Ronnie Playfair's jaw dropped even further, and the smile froze on his face. You share your buns with Mr. Gruber, he repeated. Give him the money, cried someone in the audience as the applause died down. <clears throat> you said it might be a trick question, cried someone else amid laughter. Now you've got a trick answer. Ronnie Playfair fingered his collar nervously, and a strange look came over his face as he received a signal from the man wearing headphones to give Paddington the money. Are you going to stop now, Bear? he asked hopefully, <laughs> as he handed Paddington, Paddington five crisp one-pound notes. Or do you want to go on for the next prize of fifty pounds? I'd like to go on, please, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington eagerly, as he hurriedly locked the money away in his suitcase. I shouldn't do that, said Ronnie Playfair as he dipped his hand into the barrel and withdrew another piece of paper. If you get this question wrong, I shall want to fi want the five pounds back. Oh dear, said Mrs. Brown. I feel all turned over inside. I hope Paddington doesn't do anything silly and lose his five pounds. He'll be so upset we shall never hear the last of it. <laughs> right, said Ronnie Playfair, holding up his hand once again for silence. For fifty pounds here is question number two, 
and it's a two-part question. Listen carefully. If, he said, you had a piece of wood eight feet long and you cut it in half, and if you cut the two pieces you then have into half, and if you then cut all the pieces into half again, how many pieces would you have? Eight, said Paddington promptly. Very good, Bear, said Ronnie Playfair approvingly. Now, he continued, pointing to a large clock by his side, here's the second part of the question. How long will each of the pieces be? You have ten seconds to answer, starting from now. Eight feet, said Paddington, almost before the Master of Ceremonies had time to start the clock. Eight feet? repeated Ronnie Playfair. You sure you won't change your mind? No, thank you, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington firmly. In that case, said Ronnie Playfair, as the triumphantly bang, he bang, triumphantly banged the gong, I must ask for the five pounds back. The answer is one foot. If I had a piece of wood eight feet long and I cut it in half, I would have two piece, pieces four feet long. And if I cut those in half, I would have four pieces two feet long. And if I cut each of those in half, I would have eight pieces one foot long. Having finished his speech, Ronnie Playfair turned and beamed a self-satisfied smile on the audience. You can't argue with that bear, he explained. Oh no, Mr. Playfair, said Paddington politely. I'm sure that's right for you, piece of wood, but I could mind the other but I could mind the other way. Once again the smile froze on Ronnie, Ronnie Playfair's face. You did what? he exclaimed. I cut mine down the middle, said Paddington. So I had eight pieces eight feet long. But if you ask to cut a plank of wood in half, stuttered Ronnie Playfair, Playfair you cut it across the middle, not down the middle. It stands to reason. Not if you're a bear, said Paddington, <laughs> remembering his efforts at carpentry in the past. If you're a bear, it's safer to cut it down the middle. Ronnie Playfair took a deep breath and forced a sickly smile to his face as he handed Paddington a large bundle of notes. I think you'll find they're all there, bear, he said stiffly as Paddington sat down on the stage and began counting them. We are not in the habit of diddling people. Ronnie Playfair looked anxiously at his watch. The program seemed to be taking a lot longer than usual. Normally he would have got through at least five contestants by now. There are only five minutes left, he said. And I've got two. Do you want to go on for the final prize of 500 pounds? 500 pounds, exclaimed Judy in a tone of awe. If I were Paddington, said Mrs. Brown, I'd stop now and make sure of what I've got. The Browns grouped themselves even closer around their television screen 